Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks, uh, Rosemary. Um, it's, a, it's a great privilege to have a chance to talk to you. Uh, as Chris indicated, I am not of you. Uh, I come from a, a kind of a, a different world, though I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, large-scale societal transitions to more equitable and sustainable futures, and that obviously entails thinking a bit about energy. Uh, just right at the moment, we happen to be doing some work, um, the Design Innovation Research Centre is doing some work. We do a lot of problem reframing and we're helping uh, a particular uh, corporation try and think about a peer-to-peer -peer energy uh, intervention. Uh, and it would be very interesting for you to know who that is because they have nothing to do with the energy sector. So it's very interesting to do work for someone not, not in energy trying to get into the energy sector. And so we've been thinking a bit about that space at the moment. Um, but as Chris indicated, I'm, I'm going to give you hopefully uh, a, a bit of a wake up. It's been um, a dense day. It's been a long day. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you from strange angles that might not make entire sense. And in addition to speaking from design, which is why I get to wear a t-shirt none of you do, uh, <laughs> I will actually oddly talk quite academically as well, though, you know, I, I will try, they're going to be history lessons, but I will try and keep them uh, relevant and brief. Uh, so I'll begin slightly, let's say, interactively. How's your conferencing going today? It's good? Yeah, your, your conferencing, uh, well? Uh, sorry, I stole this from someone on Twitter. Um, you know, what, what is involved in conferencing? Are you a skilled conferencer? Who considers themselves to be a skilled conferencer? Can you put up your hand? Only one. <laughs> Rosemary, of course. Okay, how many of you are novice conferences? How many of you hate conferencing? <laughs> All right, so a lot of you are under here under duress. And, and then I could kind of say, you know, so uh, it's not really a verb, but what is entailed in conferencing? There are a series of products. Hopefully there are chairs. I would love to go to a standing conference. Has anyone been to a standing conference? Do anyone have standing meetings? Right, they, they change the culture. Standing conference, maybe a bit long, would be an interesting thing to begin innovating around. So you have chairs. Uh, you have a whole bunch of things that you don't tend to think about, but you hope they're good, which seem to me a good analogy for the energy sector, like the catering. Yeah? So it's a part of conferencing, but you don't really think it is, but it's actually kind of important. Or the IT, we've had a seamless IT today, no. which is, yes. <laughs> he said, I, you are being hosted at the University of Technology, Sydney, which is a sure sign that it won't go right, by the way. But um, sorry, but I'm sure my colleagues here are doing a superb job. So there are a whole bunch of products involved in conferencing, and then, as we indicated, there are certain skills involved in conferencing. And, and one could say there are certain meanings attached to conferencing. I take it you all have a particular purpose in coming here, and you're all halfway through wondering if you've attained that purpose. And you're also in a position, as we just heard in terms of the panel, you're also in a position to kind of evaluate whether you're achieving that purpose well. We were asked this morning uh, who had breakfasted. The question I would ask is who breakfasted well this morning? <laughs> Not so many. And, and if you breakfast well, what does it entail? Balanced eating, nutritional balance, yes, not just sugary cereal. It, it entailed a chance to actually listen to the news or read the newspaper or a chance to engage with your family. There's a whole bunch of qualities that attend to breakfasting. And the way I'm talking now is the way designers think. I'm just trying to warm you up to get you to think about the way designers think. Because designers are always concerned with practices. They're concerned with the social practices that people engage in. And they're very interested in the qualities that people attach to those practices. And so I'm kind of asking whether the qualities associated with conferencing are being attained right now for you, and what it would take to kind of change that. Because, of course, to some extent as an academic in a climate-changing world, uh, we conference a lot when we're not teaching, and that has a very large uh, carbon footprint. So academics are constantly these privileged people floating around the world. Uh, we don't get to be in business class like you do. We just sit in the economy section. But we fly around the world, and I'm not sure I get a lot of value from the conferences I go to. 
And I would love to transition conferences to something completely different. And if I was to do that, I would begin maybe coming up with other products that would allow me to engage in conferences without necessarily having to fly there. So we heard before that uh, uh, the research group had done a lot of their interviews on Zoom. I don't know how much of your life is on Zoom or Skype or some other equivalent. A lot. Do you enjoy the platform? Does it work for you? No. I mean, it has certain qualities, but it's missing other things. It's obviously very difficult to be at a, con uh, a conference because part of the information you're getting is not just the face and the face, but when you hear everybody else around you, like if you suddenly get distracted by email and then everybody around you starts attending, you attend and suddenly you think, oh, this was an important bit. So you need that social context. It'd be really interesting to try and design to enable that practice around conferencing. But if I started doing that kind of designing, if I started making a different way to engage with people in terms of sharing research, I'm not sure it would still be the equivalent of a conference. I don't think I'm still actually doing the same practice. I might have actually changed the practice. Part of the reason why I design the products is not because I just want a better at distance conferencing. I want a whole new thing. I'm not sure what that thing is. I don't have a name for it at the moment. I could just call it research engaging at a distance. And that would be a design brief. And the whole point here is that it would actually be a transition. It wouldn't just be improved conferencing. It would be a transition to a very different type of conference. And it would be difficult for you right now to do a quick workshop to try and work that out, particularly at the end of the day. So I'll move on. But the point I'm trying to make is that to some extent what I'm getting at is that I'm hearing a lot of people today talking about how we meet expectations. And I'm very interested to talk to you about transitions as ways in which we change expectations. Obviously, part of your job is something in between, meeting changing expectations and meeting and changing expectations. And this is the brief of transition design, and this is what I want to talk to you a little bit about. Okay, so I run the Design Innovation Research Centre. I have the great uh, privilege of inheriting an organisation that was set up by uh, Case Dorst. Uh, sorry, Case Dorst uh, published this book which uh, covers a lot of the work that they've done over the last decade. It's mostly social service design. They do a lot of work with New South Wales Justice in the criminal justice sector. They bring design innovation to rethinking policing, courts, corrections, pre-criminal life, post-criminal life. And then we think about lots of adjacent areas to that social housing and now, as you've just heard a little bit, around energy and other types of sustainable transitions. The focus is very much on problem reframing <clears throat> rather than the design thinking you might be familiar with, which is more solutioning. So when I say design, I think it's important to just recognise that I don't mean this taken from the report that's now been shared with you. I don't mean technology. And I don't mean necessarily making things seamless. I think one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of today is that the futures of energy engagement in a more sustainable system are not going to have the level of current set and forget, in which case I get bill surprise at the end of the month. Right? I, I'm hearing that you would like people to be more engaged, and I'm hearing that customers also want to be more engaged, in which case those interactions might actually be seamful, not seamless. They obviously don't want to be a burden. You don't want to be overly notified every five minutes. Hi, I'm your network provider. Are we doing a good job? Fill in our NPS right now. Right? You don't want that, but you don't necessarily want this picture. You want to start creating different types of practices associated with energy. And the other thing about this picture is this picture looks like it's about the grey device being held in the hand, but in fact what you're looking at is a practice, a practice not dissimilar to breakfasting or conferencing. This is somebody for whom using that device is seamless because they themselves have changed the way they interact. It's not all the magic of the grey device. We co-evolve with our technologies. And transitioning the energy system is about co-evolving both the system and the customers, and so not just meeting expectations, but changing expectations. 
So I come from design. This is normally what you associate with designers. This is one of the founders of modern industrial design, Raymond Lowy. He was a fashion illustrator. Uh, the Great Depression came. He suddenly saw a good opportunity and uh, took his form giving skills and sold them to the captains of industry who were a little desperate. And I tell you this because I want to explain an overall picture for where I think you are at the moment, as I hear you talk at the moment, about, for example, being customer-centred, having a charter to be customer-centred. And I want to give you a bit of a, a history of that from the perspective of design. So design was kind of birthed in its modern form, in its kind of consumer form, around the 1930s. And it was associated with uh, large-scale, government-impositioned changes to the nature of the built environment. This was the process of modernisation. So this was the New Deal. This was the moment at which we said, right, top down, completely change the whole landscape, the whole economy. Let's actually uh, go into debt to build the Tennessee Valley Dam system so that we can begin doing uh, the electrification of all American uh, uh, houses. And you get the birth of the modern suburban house coming out of this moment. This moment at which dams create electricity, which go into wall plugs in houses, and then you have a whole bunch of industrial designers who are quickly making those products to plug in to the other end. So it was a beautifully worked out system, and it was the project of modernization, and we live in the benefits of that system. However, things have changed. Obviously, things are changing. This is what all the discussions here are about. Part of what's happened is that this was a very successful process of attaining all product category saturation in our houses, except for some of our vulnerable uh, cu uh, customers, for example. But mostly we are talking about the rollout of a suburbia in which houses are stuffed full of every product category, reaching almost 100% saturation. This was a bit of a crisis for capitalism. Right? This was happening in the second half of the 20th century. You start getting a bit of a crisis because up till then, designers could just make things in streamlined ways and people would plug them in because they thought they were getting some benefit from it. But once they've got one of everything, you need to start changing how you attend to those people and you need to start coming up with different ways of servicing them. So in fact, design went through what it sounds like the energy sector is now going through uh, in the 1990s, in the 1990s, uh, a really great interaction designer called Alan Cooper published a very beautiful book called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. The inmates, in this case, are engineers, <laughs> software engineers. And the book is, do not let software engineers design software. <laughs> you need to get, or at least get, your software engineers to engage with customers. They can't just force them to work out how to engage with an operating system. You need to understand their workflow. You need to understand their households. You need to understand something about their practices. You need to start to be customer-centred. So I always think it's, it's, it's always a bit of a worry, just to say this very briefly, it's always a bit of a worry when uh, an industry has been operating for 100 years and then it suddenly says, it would be a revolution to be customer-centred. <laughs> it's always a bit of a worry. So design went through this and it developed a bunch of different methods and processes to start to be customer-centred. And we are seeing this roll out through the economy at the moment. We are seeing the arrival of both customer-centredness and customization. We are seeing this uh, occurring particularly in terms of digital transformation. I said Alan Cooper was a, a software designer and it comes very much from that domain, the software domain uh, then impacting the way in which we deal with all consumer goods and then eventually uh, our built environments. Uh, we've seen it in this country roll through the financial institutions with some of the leads in adopting uh, design thinking based customer centeredness. We've seen government actually being a major driver in this country, uh, a little bit behind uh, the UK. Uh, but nevertheless, we've seen customer centeredness kind of arriving. We're seeing the emergence of a bit of a customer centered health model. Uh, lots of innovation in America around that. We're seeing, finally, infrastructure companies beginning to be customer-centred. We've seen that in relation to engineering companies uh, winning some of the big contracts for transport, particularly in New South Wales. Transport for New South Wales uh, requires customer-centredness of every one of its attendees now. And so you're seeing this wash through, 
And it feels to me, and I hope I'm not sounding too uh, patronising when I say this, but it feels to me as someone who's not of you that when I come to an event like this, it's like the wave is now getting to you, right, to start to be, to no longer be just a big dam imposing uh, a necessary value on the modernisation of society, but in fact to have to start to be customer-centred. Now, design knows something about customer-centredness. <clears throat> it knows something that I think progressive forms of market research know, which is that it's not that easy to simply be customer-centred, partly because of this rather paternalistic uh, sort of assessment of customers. I don't like this Ogilvy quote, but uh, nevertheless, it's somewhat true. And so you need to be innovative in the way you ask the questions, which is why we, we see the report that's given today and the kind of research that's been shared. It's been done innovatively in order to try and get customers to say something more than uh, uh, the other end of the question, to actually show you new things. But the interesting thing about design is that design is not interested in what people currently want. It's not interested in what people currently say. It's not even interested in what people currently do because it is future-oriented. It is interested in, if I can be an academic, the subjunctives, the woulds, coulds, shoulds, the mights. It's interested in the future. I don't want to know what you are doing. I want to know what else you might do if I were to make it available to you. That's a very different type of question. And this is part of what customer-centeredness means, not just listening to customers, but actually beginning to engage them in ways that would allow them to tell you what else might be possible. Now, this is not a good example. This particular firm obviously still has quite a modernist imposition of its design form on you. But I think it's a useful quote, nevertheless, to just orient you to the future-orientedness that is design. Uh, it's also important to recognise that the purpose of design are to make the habits of the future. Design often looks like it's going to be flashy and you're going to notice it. Those are all the dust collectors. Actual design falls in the background and becomes part of your habitual new practices. You don't notice the glasses on your face if they are well designed. You don't notice the device in your hand as you try to find an electric charging station on your phone. So design aims at this kind of withdrawal. It aims to, to create new types of habits. So as a result, I'm kind of saying to you that design has gone through these three phases. It's moved from thinking about a kind of imposed form uh, at the other end of mass production to being a source of customer centricness. But there is a new revolution occurring, and that's what I want to talk to you about because it's part of transition, which is the need to start thinking about actual participation. We've heard some of these terms floating around. I heard some of them uh, at lunch uh, and at the breaks. Uh, and you're seeing some of them in different sectors where it's not just about being engaged with your customers but actually designing with them. So not just hearing what they want and then going away and designing it and then maybe testing it, but actually living with them as they help evolve new value propositions. Very difficult thing to think about when we're talking about it in such a kind of technical way as in this kind of space. Uh, so some of you may have heard of uh, uh, agile systems which are uh, precisely about moving fast to get things so that they can actually be in the market. So you can learn from your lead, lead users so you have minimum viable products. And so I'll just deposit this idea, I'll come back to it. What is minimum viable product infrastructure? Right? How do you partner in creating practices around infrastructures that are just being trialled? Difficult when obviously the sunk costs to get the investment up to actually create the trial are going to be very large. But it's also important to just sit back and say, so why is this happening? Why are we seeing a sudden move, not just from customer centeredness, but to actual participation? Sorry. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just give you these three quick indicators, and again, we've heard some of this on some of the panels today, about why I believe we're getting this push towards participation at the moment. So I'll start with the bottom one, which is my coffee machine. Uh, this is a very nice Spanish coffee machine. It's very good pressure. I bought it when I was in America when I first moved to uh, New York. Uh, this was 2008. Uh, the first wave of Australian baristas had not yet arrived, so coffee was terrible. Right? So the government wasn't providing good coffee. The market wasn't providing good coffee. 
but te technological innovation had allowed me to make my own coffee. Right? So I subscribed to Blue Bottle, I got uh, beans shipped over from San Francisco at vast carbon price, and I made the best coffee in Brooklyn. People loved it when we had a block party because they would come around and get my coffee. And then they started finding Australians everywhere doing good coffee, uh, and I was just left to do it on my own. So we've had technological innovations, I'm totally happy with that. Uh, we've had these technological innovations which actually allow prosumers to begin to participate. We actually have consumers being producers uh, and being able to have their own artisanal quality to that, no longer having to just take what the market offers. They're doing that partly because, as I said before, they're getting a bit sick of not having got customization out of customer-centered turns for 20 years from the economy. It's a very nice book by Shoshana Zuboff saying that we have not yet had businesses that are actually in the business of supporting customers. You may know Shoshana Zuboff's latest book, uh, um, Surveillance Capitalism. This was the book she wrote previously with her, her then partner, the late James Max Min. Uh, so we have a desire for participation because we're not getting what we want from the market. We have the capacity in terms of technologies. And then we have this other major problem, which is massive distrust as capitalism and, and modern democratic societies shift from the distribution of goods, like electricity through the New Deal, to the distribution of bads, like ecological pollution, like having to pay the price for a transition in the energy sector. Now these are probabilistic things and they're complicated things and people are apparently no longer trusting experts like me, a professor at a university, to recommend this. And so they are demanding participation in the way society distributes these bads and that this is their form of politics. They're voting uh, protest in actual democracies and instead desiring to be participants of conversations about how to actually do these transitions. So these three things are coming together and I think this is why we are getting participation as a major driver as a third wave in kind of design. <clears throat> Again, this should be terrifying to most of the people in the room. Uh, I'm just, I just picked it as a, a, a little symposium that was being held up the road at the um, University of Sydney. Um, but this idea of DIY infrastructure, this is the driver of the transition in addition to everything else. In addition to sustainable equitable futures, it is the requirement that we start getting something that we can control ourselves to some extent. So it's very interesting to then think how you design for that, how you might start to do transition designs, how you might take everything that designers know about customer-centered service design, everything they know about social innovation design in alternative economies, and begin to think about moving whole systems. And it's that that I want to talk to you about. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about how to actually do this. Obviously, it is something uh, I don't need to tell you that has uh, enormous priorities. We heard this morning in the kind of opening that we need to move very fast. Uh, we need to move terrifyingly fast. I, snap, I again stole this from Twitter to stick in the, the deck. Uh, the versions I had actually came from Saul Griffith. Saul Griffith um, was a, a, a TED Prize winner, Australian engineer, lives in America, does kite flying power generation. Do people know Saul Griffith? And he gave a, a little scene, something else to look on YouTube instead of ducks. He gave a great talk uh, very early on, uh, this one on your right here. His figure was that we need uh, 100 square metres of solar every uh, second for 25 years to kind of get to some system of decarbonisation. I think he still had fossil fuels in it. I went to check out, we see he did this 10 years ago, so then I went to see what else he was doing. Uh, and he's done a new one recently saying we have zero time left. So we need to do these kind of rapid transitions. It was great to hear this morning from Jeff to hear that kind of speed. There was optimism about that speed. Much of what I was hearing sounded like it was because it was just adding things to the existing uh, built environment. We just put cells on, we put uh, wind out at sea, we put batteries against our house. It's everything kind of can be added. What I really worry is when some of these infrastructures are actually going to have to require uh, the removal of existing systems, modern systems that are actually concreted in place. Uh, this was the very famous detonation of pruitt Igo social housing in uh, America, kind of signals the beginning of post-modernity, if you know your architectural history. Uh, 
This seems to me another big challenge when it's not just adding, it's actually also taking things out or actually restructuring our built environments. And then again, as we heard this morning, the real challenge is the social side. How on earth do we actually change social? How do we change social at the same speed as adding new technologies? I'm a little more optimistic about this and I'm a little more optimistic because I'm a designer in this space. Uh, in 2004, I was doing a lot of research on this very academic, European-funded work, product service systems. We were trying to work out how to decouple use and ownership. I think these were the words that uh, Chris couldn't recognise in the biography. So we were trying to do uh, lifestyle as a service back in 2004. I was doing this to reduce materials intensity of society to make, to make us more sustainable. There were lots of people doing this work. This was the summary paper. It said it's not going to work. I believed them. That was 2004. Not a single one of those researchers who were experts on thinking about shared product use anticipated the sharing economy. Not a single one of them would have said in 2004 that this is the world in 2014. And what we had underestimated were the cultural shifts associated with the arrival of social media, the switch from an anonymous web to a true identity web, locational media, the arrival of smartphones, and all of a sudden you have a new type of sociality. You have a whole bunch of people who are able to risk manage engaging with strangers in low-level economic interactions that might even involve them sleeping under the same roof. And so these changes can happen. And when these changes happen, they can be considered to be transitions. This is a diagram of transition management. It is an awful diagram as a designer. I can't believe I showed it to you. <laughs> the point of view to get from this diagram is that there are these locked-in landscapes, and transitions are about how we move to new landscapes. And there are lots of theories about how you might do this. This one looks nice and semi-linear, uh, in fact, the diagrams look a bit more like this. This is a, a very famous paper by Frank Hales talking about the shift from horse-drawn carriage-based cities, horse-based cities to car-based cities. As you can see, there's a lots of different kinds of innovations uh, moving all over the place. That's exactly what it feels like now as we start thinking about peer-to-peer -peer and somebody doing blockchain over here and then a whole bunch of people trying to work out the role of gas in the transition and then uh, enormous fights about how we distribute bads uh, between southeast Queensland and the rest of Australia. Right? This feels like the exact mess that we're in the moment. So let me give you some quick examples of kind of transitions that I think uh, might be models for how you begin to design in this regard. We've seen a revival of cycling in most large consumer cities, uh, ones with hills and dangerous driving like Sydney, less so, ones that are flat like European ones, more so. But we know that these are a mix of different innovations in a whole bunch of different areas that create the practice of cycling. You need protected lanes, though protected lanes aren't much good to protect you from the rain. You need workplaces to begin to actually store your bicycles and have showers. I can see a future in which jackets no longer sit at home, they always sit at work because you cycle to work. Why on earth do you wear a jacket on the way home? So you actually need a whole wardrobe. Your, your workwear should actually be at work. And if we did this, we would transition to much higher levels of cycling. You actually need all different types of fashion. This is a particular uh, dress pant that was made uh, out of a jodhpur-like material, so it's both flexible. You can cycle in it, but it will still look good when you walk into the boardroom. Uh, it's oil-resistant, water-resistant, so you can get splashed by cars. As you can see, this one's on a hipster fixed uh, gear bike. So you need changes to fashion, you need changes to roads, you need changes to workplaces to enable a transition. And these transitions are ongoing. Uh, you get changes to the notion of locating where your bikes are. You maybe don't need to own the bike. You get uh, uh, systems that work for people who wear clothes that don't allow them to cycle or might carry bags. Uh, you get a whole bunch of other dangers, which is at the same time you've got ride sharing and somebody using seven different apps simultaneously in a car you would not want to be a cyclist in front of this car. So we have an ongoing sets of transitions. Uh, you have these kinds of transitions. This was the social learning of interaction design that you all went to. Normally, if I do this to students, they didn't go through it. They're all digital natives. But you went through this. You learnt 
to touch things that weren't buttons. You were raised being told never to touch the glass. Do not touch the television. You will die, it will die. <laughs> now we're touching televisions all the time. You had to learn that. You all had to learn, many of us still haven't learnt, that Adele is not on my computer, she's in the cloud, right? And sometimes she's on this phone and sometimes she's on this computer and some, I don't know where she is, she's all time, all place. And I had to learn that whole new imaginary, that whole new uh, way of thinking about things. Uh, and then finally, we were taught that the couch is no longer a space for relaxing. It's a place for continuing to work and do email while you Netflix. Right? So we've actually changed the built environment through this type of transition. And again, it was a fairly rapid transition and it was a socio-technical transition. It was not just technical, it was social. It is also continuing. As this happened, we started to learn to not only swipe in order to work out uh, regular information, but we started having our sociality being engaged in swiping in the bottom middle there. Uh, we started working out how to um, find things. We, we started having completely different work practices. We work would not exist if we had not already turned couches into workspaces. So these are interesting transitions and in each of these cases I'm giving you these examples to show you that these major changes in the cultural practices that have occurred associated with these technologies all came through particular design innovations. It was designers acting at the pinch point between an infrastructure and a user helping people learn to interact in particular ways. This is a kind of a very literal version of the way in which design works. It teaches you how to interact. A door handle is a hand, right? A seat is mimetic of your spine. It's attracting your bottom all the time. So these are how these things work. So one could then say, okay, so say I wanted to do the transition in relation to distributed energy. Say I wanted to start getting a lot more peer-to-peer -peer as a way of moving to a, a possibly desirable future. The pinch point to that transition, amongst other cultural practices, will be the interface design of this device. This one is not going to get us there. Right? Aesthetically, it is not in sync with the very environment blurred out in the background. This is not a device for the kitchen. It doesn't look like a kitchen appliance. I'm not sure it should be in the kitchen. I don't know where the room is that you do your distributed energy negotiation. And I'm, I'm not devolving this to some bot, right? I'm not devolving this to bot. I want control. I want to have transparency on this system. So there's a huge design problem. What does this thing look like? What could it possibly be? We know from Yolanda Stringer's work, it definitely should not be designed for very particular kinds of humans who tend to be actually the inmates in the asylum, <laughs> right? So it should not be designed for you. And the problem is if you went and asked your customers according to your customer charter, they couldn't tell you what it looks like either right now. And there's a real danger that the kind of overall version of what we're making at the moment is going to end up in this kind of abysmal future because what you're doing when you design distributed energy systems through the interface of some particular appliance in a house, you are changing the meaning of house. You are changing the meaning of home. Just like if I was to transition conferences, they would no longer be conferences anymore. So when you design distributed energy for a home, you are changing the nature of home. And I think this is a very important thing to think about. It puts the burden on what you are currently doing way up. Right? You're not just fighting the federal government at the moment. Right? You are engaged in a civilization saving activity, according to climate change. And we do have precedents for when people were able to do this. We do have a moment at which uh, designers and engineers did go to the public, in this case the New York World's Fair of 1939, Norman Bell Getty's very famous Futurama exhibit done for, for uh, General Motors Holden. Uh, you can't say that word around here anymore. Uh, and people flocked in there to see the city of the future and lo and behold we got that city. And it was a really bad idea. Right? You could not see from that seat up there that it would be impossible to cross six lanes of road when General Motors managed to get their vision of the future of the city. 
But there was a moment at which companies like yours went to the public and said, this is the future that we would like to be designing for. People went to this event and they got this little badge, I have seen the future. There are many other different versions of these, by the way, I don't have time to go through this, but it needn't be an all-male panel version of the future. Uh, this was a very gorgeous set of research done by a feminist architectural historian, Dolores Hayden, on the fact that a number of feminist socialist architects in the late 19th century had visions for cities that were wholly sharing economies, precisely so that women weren't enchained uh, alone in houses. And they designed it. The Lazy Susan was developed by a cooperative housing in America. Right? It was done. These people were innovating new ways of living. And this was their vision for the cities which were only just being built. End of the 19th century, we didn't have big metropolises. They said this could be the city. They didn't win. They didn't win the argument. Conservatives got in and said uh, suburban houses with big mortgages make for good workers and women should be doing the work. We'll give you labour-saving devices plugged in at the wall. You should be happy with that. So we didn't get this revolution, but we do have ways in which we could create these visions. And so I kind of ask you, what is the vision that you might put in front of consumers and help them participate in creating? Because what you are trying to do is to change the landscape. This is the landscape at the moment. This is Scarry's picture of uh, uh, coal-fired power stations. And we are locked into this particular landscape. And we're not just concreted into it. It is our imaginaries. It is our expectations. I've heard a lot that the customer wants reliability. That imaginary is as concreted in as the very copper wires themselves. And if we are going to transition, we need to tackle some of these imaginaries. Because these aren't the only imaginaries we have around power, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> some of you may know, I used to live in Pennsylvania, so I know this quite a lot. Uh, I know the Amish people. I know that for a long time, people of Christian faith and some other faiths, uh, uh, Jewish people on, on uh, the Sabbath, recognise that Powered devices are evil. Electricity is a sign of the devil. You engage in it when you have to, but mostly you try to avoid it. And that leads for a wholesome manual life, a life of organic manual labour. Now, that is a worldview that exists today. It's a worldview of the past. And we know that there are various markets who might be marginal for whom that's a very important part of their life. We know that parents are trying to work out how to digital detox. Quickest way to digital detox your teenager is have a blackout. Thank you, Osgrid. <laughs> this becomes a transition opportunity. It becomes a moment at which we can start to explore new practices. And it suddenly becomes possible to see a crack in the infrastructure of the landscape that says reliability is all. It won't be unreliable, nobody's going to want an unreliable system, but they might want to know about load shedding, they might want to know moments at which they could go out. They might want to know that when it goes out, certain things stay on. You get Wi-Fi, but you don't have to do the washing up anymore. Right? So there are ways in which we can begin to imagine these different kind of things. We know that there are other kind of imaginaries, moments at which people spend a lot of time thinking about storing energy. Uh, this is the great uh, Children's Illustrated book, Blueberries for Sal, about a small kid meeting with a bear while picking blueberries. Because you pick the blueberries and then you can them so that you actually have energy over winter. Right? Processes of canning, processes of smoking. These are all ways in which we do food storage. One can imagine this would be a transition around energy as well. One can imagine a whole bunch of people thinking about their batteries in a particular way. One can think about doing work on a neighbourhood level. One can think about local groups. One could design the devices that enable people to change their expectations about the energy system. Sometimes you might go on holiday and you might go to Milan. Here's a trip advisor about Milan. Please know that the basic rule in Milan is one plus one equals blackout. <laughs> because all the houses have low ampage and generally if you're going to turn on one device you better turn off another. Because if you put two devices on at the same time, two big load devices, the house trips. It's no hassle. One of the great memories of living in Milan, the design capital of the universe, 
is constantly having to go out and reset the meter. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of hassle the first time. The second time you get used to it, it becomes a habit. It's not well designed. We could design it well. We could enable people to do load shedding themselves. This is not anathema. We can change these imaginaries. We plead with people to change with imaginaries so that they can do their patriotic business uh, as part of being part of a nation. One can imagine doing this in part of regions. Uh, there are lots of different examples of these which I don't have so much time to go through. We can design for types of demand managing which would be the social side of the rapid transitions we need to make. Quick paper saying, well, when you do demand management, I hear a lot of people talking about it purely in terms of incentives and uh, pricing. What you're actually talking about is deciding whether I'm going to do the laundering now or not. If I have a business meeting tomorrow, I need that white shirt, which I never wear, but some of you need a white shirt for tomorrow. So you can't load shed the washing right now. So when you do demand management, you are asking people to redesign laundering, you're asking them to redesign breakfasting, you're asking them to redesign homing. You're actually coming up with a very different meaning of the word home, as was identified in this paper. That whether people think of their home as a, a project, whether they think of it as a haven, whether they think of it as a site of activity, that will determine how much they could imagine engaging in demand management projects. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is that there is a new wave of design coming, that you need to be engaging not just in customer-centeredness, as we heard in the panel before, but beginning to imagine types of participation in which you participate with customers in creating new futures that neither you nor them can imagine right now. That there are more possibilities than we have on the table, and that design is one of the mechanisms by which we get there. What I'm talking about in this case is not just consultation and not just market research. And it's trying to find in the space of infrastructure ways of trying out new practices. That when you make a transition in a large thing like an infrastructure, you are asking people to change their meaning of homes. You're asking them to live differently. So you should give them some time to try it on. And it should be error friendly. They should be able to opt out. I'm going to try demand managing for three months, and then I'm going to stop. And I'm going to do it because I know I can stop. And these trials are occurring already. I'm not talking about things that are not happening. But we need to start doing this at every aspect of the transition. We need to start moving to very different systems very rapidly, and the only way to do that is to get these kinds of participatory trialling. They have lots of technical names. They're called bounded socio-technical uh, experiments in the transition management literature. Uh, sometimes they're called niche innovation management. Uh, some of you may have heard them referred to as kind of a living lab, uh, the moment at which you actually ask people to be source of experiment. Where are these people? How might you find them? You are learning to see how differential the market actually is. And you're also being told that the market itself within those segments changes over time. So a wealthy, well-educated person is a share household and then is a small family if they're heteronormative, and then is a retiree. And one of the interesting things about this life stages work is that each one of these shifts can be referred to as an innovation junction. It's the moment at which people are completely changing their practices. That's what the research told you. People have different practices at these stages. The move from one stage to another is a great opportunity for experimentation. You, that's why all economics research is done with students, by the way because they're, they're really flexible. They'll do anything at that point. Right? They're trying on new identities. They're trying on new ways of living. That's also why they make really good workers. So these are innovation moments. They're moments in which you can actually uh, create possibilities for trialling new markets. If you can't find those test beds, those niches, then you also need to give them a vision for why they might risk participating in helping you innovate. Uh, and it's a bit of a stupid way to do this, but definitely don't use a picture like this. <laughs> you need to have strong visions to encourage people to experiment so that you and them can evolve together rapidly to more equitable and sustainable futures. Thank you very much. Thank you.